more attention would be great. Um, well, welcome. We're going to do something a little different. So we're not just going to send you out with syllabus on the first night. We're actually going to make you work for your graduate degrees. So first night up, we're going to introduce you to Mr. Chris Curran. Now, Chris, once upon a time, was just a little graduate student, just like you all, who came and sat in a little chair in this very classroom. And he dreamed of being a graduate from Lindenwood University, but we said, no, Christopher, you have to do a thesis first. So, and here he is, he's now going to defend his thesis. So, so what Chris did is while he was in this class, he got very excited about psychological skills training. And you're going to learn all about that this semester. And so in learning the material in the class, he said, you know, I'd kind of like to do something like this with the cycling team. Because Chris is uh, part of the cycling team. We probably hang cyclists in the room. We got some cycling guests, many of which were a part of Chris's study, and so Chris decided he wanted to do a thesis. Now, the reason we had Chris come in here to do his presentation, his dis sorry, I keep saying dissertation, his thesis defense, is so that any of you who may just be starting out in the graduate program who have an interest in research and want to take on this challenge, we want to invite you to seriously consider doing a thesis. It's not that difficult. And you have a chance to work with members of the graduate faculty, Dr. Schrader, Dr. Tesma, Dr. Kirksick, or myself as your chair. And if you have any visions of perhaps one day doing a doctorate, then the thesis route is definitely for you. If you want to teach at an institution of higher learning, then consider the thesis. It's really just a very long paper. Good thing is you don't have to write comprehensive exams. So if you don't like taking exams, then here's an easy way out. So if anybody is going to be interested in this thesis option, I'll talk more about it later. But right now, I'm going to turn the time over to Chris. And he's going to go ahead and defend. Write a passage. Chris, it is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know some of you didn't know we were doing this, but we are. So this is a study to assess the efficacy of implementing a in-season psychological skills training program uh, with elite cyclists. It's important to note that it's an in-season psychological skills training program. So the psychological skills may perhaps be what separates a world championship podium uh, from the rest of the competition and the others on the podium. Uh, athletes who are enrolled in a PST program must possess the desire and the maturity, but it has been suggested that athletes that are taught PST skills early on in their athletic career, that they are going to be, have an accelerated learning path uh, and development. And a strong theoretical, uh, theoretical relationship between mindfulness and self-efficacy are present uh, in sports. And when athletes practice mindfulness within their sport, they're repeating the skill with an awareness and deliberates that has uh, an awareness for their surroundings. So this is an exploratory study. It's the first in-season psychological skills study. Uh, there's a lack of current research in regards to an in-season psychological skills training program. And current research uh, suggests that a PST program should be done during the off-season, uh, among some of the reasons uh, that athletes seem to focus on performance. So the statement of the problem, there's lack of empirical research, as I just said. Uh, and we want to see if there's a, anything that we can do for an in-season psychological skills training program. And there's little research on what psychological skills uh, set successful elite cyclists apart from their non-successful elite cyclists. And there's no research regarding that in-season PST program. The purpose of this study is to assess the efficacy of developing and implementing an in-season psychological skills training program uh, to increase performance, mood state, self-advocacy, mental skills for an in-season elite cyclist. And additionally, the goal of the study was uh, to develop a success profile for elite cyclists after complete, completing a comprehensive psychological skills training program. These are the four hypotheses, four hypotheses that we had. Uh, first was the elite cyclist experiencing a PST program will put higher self-efficacy for mental skills training uh, than cyclists who do not participate in the PST program. Number two, an elite cyclist experiencing a PST program will be more successful in competition than an elite cyclist that does not participate in a PST program. And the third is that the elite cyclist experiencing a PST program will report less mood disturbance on the profile of mood states instrument 
and elite cyclists who do not participate in the PSD program. And the fourth was to develop a, su a success profile to predict a high level of performance of elite cyclists based on participation in the comprehensive PST program. <clears throat> so the definition of terms. The definition of terms are what we implemented in the psychological skills training program. So of these things, uh, it's important to note that what psychological skills training is. It's the, the training is comprised of regimented and deliberate exercises that enhance various uh, mental skills in order to improve performance results and focus and intrinsic motivation. Among those skills, we have concentration. It's a sense of being present uh, in, in regard to a particular stimulus. It's a having an individual focus on. So the actual skill in concentration is refocusing uh, to avoid those extraneous distractions. And goal set is the development of specific oriented goals. These are some of the goals uh, we had. There's three different types that we focus on. Outcome goals, performance goals, and process goals. Outcome goals are very global. Performance goals are how we get there and, uh, and what the, it's personal to us. And process goals are the day-to-day. -day. We really focused on process goals uh, in bed by 11, nutrition, things of that sort of nature uh, to get to that outcome goal. The next uh, imagery, we did a lot of imagery with the cyclists. We vividly picture an athletic experience using your imagination, using all of your senses, and doing this in a way that has performance effects in the long run. And flow, it's a state of optimal performance. It's the physiological and psychological uh, state of hyperfocus necessary where the challenge uh, is just outside of your skill set. Self-talk, it's this inner dialogue. Uh, it's creating perceptions, instructions, and judgments and explanations of one's surroundings. And arousal control. Uh, the levels of arousal are based on a spectrum, and the state of an individual's arousal is based on their psychological and physiological activation and response to the stimuli. This is a, one of the team meetings that we've implemented. It's a mindfulness session. They're focusing on the breath. Some of them have their hands over. Uh, they're doing some diaphragmatic breathing, just breathing through your belly. This is mindfulness. It's being able to have center yourself or having a non-judgmental awareness of yourself and your surroundings in that environment. And this is uh, after a, one of the mindfulness sessions that we did after a yoga class. And we walked them through, we did some, uh, this was a body scan that they did, start at their toes and work all the way up and just being come more aware of their body, being relaxed. This is that state of optimal performance, flow. Uh, you can see here one of the Lindenwood cyclists and how close they are. Uh, they're probably going you know, 25, 30 miles an hour, but they can be that close because they're so engaged and so informed in where they are. So this is the methodology. Total participants in the study, we had 53 participants. Uh, the treatment group, we had 25 cyclists, and the control group, we had 28. Among these, we had three females in both groups, 22 males in the treatment, and three in the control. Uh, USA cycling categories were professional riders, categories one, two, and three, all elite level cyclists. Uh, if you look at the mean age, very close in, in terms of uh, the mean, and their training age, which is how many years they've been training and participating in cycling, uh, right around six and a half in both groups. And uh, their, what their accomplishments are, we had five professionals in both groups, uh, multiple national championships, world-class athletes and in both groups uh, with one world champion and one Pan American Games champion. And uh, I had professional relationships as the primary investigator with these participants who completed uh, the surveys. Uh, among the methodology, these are the participants, uh, their pro or the Myers-Briggs type indicator we took a personality test. And we found elite cyclists, 43.4% uh, of these 53 uh, groups were actually um, ISTJ or ISTP. That's introvert, sensing, thinking, judging, uh, with the P and the uh, ISTP group being perceiving. Uh, interesting when the norm is only 11, 14, and 4 to 6, and um, uh, maybe the elite cyclists are more likely to be of that personality type. 
So the data collection, uh, the data collection was from February to May 2015. The treatment group, pre and post test, uh, they both had a hard copy of the primary thesis shared uh, present, which is uh, right. And their control group was submitted a pre and post test uh, through surveymonkey.com. And both the treatment and the control group uh, submitted the results to an email address not accessible to me, myself, or myself, the primary investigator. And all data submissions were coded. The primary investigator uh, was given access to the data after uh, the data was uh, submitted, or at, after, long after the fact, so uh, at the end of the post-test. The purpose of the universal identification number was to distinguish between the pre- and the post-test data. This is the methodology overview. We had a 12-week psychological skills training program. Remember, it's in season. Uh, so week one to week 12, we did all those things, goal setting, uh, motivation, self-talk, uh, the things that we went over in the uh, definition of terms. And on the right column, we have a weekly overview. Monday morning, we sent out weekly videos. Uh, I did some recordings of videos, and we implemented a psychological skills training program that way, and through teaching the cyclists. On Tuesday, we, every, other, or every fourth Tuesday, we had a team meeting uh, where we did some mindfulness activities. Coach Paul came in. He spoke to the athletes. And on Wednesday, we had a mindfulness session uh, with yoga and well yoga and then a mindfulness session following. Uh, Thursday, uh, we had profile mood every second week. Friday and Saturday, Sunday, we're all uh, travel and race days. These are the instruments that we used. I'll be going uh, into more detail with these, each individual one. The athletic coping skills inventory, the ASCII 28, is, uh, so it measures the self-efficacy of psychological skills. Uh, what, that's what it boils down to. It's just a question, and you answer it, and it comes out with uh, these sub-traits over here on the left-hand side. Coping with adversity, coachability, concentration, confidence and achievement motivation, goal setting, mental preparation, freedom from worry, and peak and pressure. It measures all those things to this 28-question inventory. And it's very important because it, it uh, actually measures the psychological skills. The sports emotional reaction profile is CERT. It's a reaction to sports scenario questions. So you answer the question, and based upon that answer, you have a subject, and uh, it gives you a, a, north, a score for that, uh, eight to 12, or zero to 12 points. So desire, assertiveness, sensitivity, tension, confidence, personal accountability, and self-discipline are what that tool measures. We did that the pre and the post test. This is the profile mood state. It was measured six times throughout the course of the semester. Um, mood disturbance, so it measures uh, the subtraits in the, the blue diagram over there. Mood disturbance, total mood score, anger, confusion, fatigue, tension, depression, and vigor. This was a uh, how they submitted the results. I actually took a screenshot of the results and submitted to that email address. And the, this is the iceberg profile. It's an iceberg profile because it, it peaks at the top and it's low here. So tension, depression, anger uh, were low. That's a good thing. Uh, and vigor is high. Vigor is energy. Fatigue and confusion are also low. And that's what a successful performer looks like in of that. So a less successful profile is across the board. This is the active identity measurement scale and post-PST questionnaire. This actually measures the athlete's identity uh, the in the black diagram there. Uh, their questions and it gives you a, a total score. We'll look into more of that details later. And these last two were on the same test, but they didn't know it. These are validity questions to measure brief uh, their beliefs in sports psychology. So what it actually does is uh, both questions are very similar. You use a Likert scale, strongly disagree to strongly agree, and you measure those, uh, or you answer those questions accordingly in both groups. So Another thing was the methodology of the instrument, that, or sorry, the USA Cycling Race Results uh, ranking score. We did, uh, they had a ranking score that comes out, and we, met, we compared the 2014 and 2015 results in the criterion, individual time trial, and the road race, uh, the distances and times at the bottom of those races. Uh, results, these are individual rider results. There's, in 2015, uh, this individual on the left, he won the Omnia National Championship, and he also won the Road Race National Championship. 
and the other individual on the podium got third in the road race, and he got second the Omnium. And this individual, she was fifth in the criterion in the, in the national championship that year. And these are some more of the results. This is an independent sample t-test or PST program uh, participation based upon nationals qualification. Basically what this says, we track the PST participation. And those who qualify for uh, nationals, they participated more in the PST program. Percentages wise are right here. Seven, uh, those who qualified uh, participated 74.2% of the time of the PST program. Whereas those who did not qualify participated at 62.73. Uh, so it might behoove you to uh, participate in the psychological skills training program if you're trying to qualify for nationals. This is another, uh, another result. It's the paired sample t-test for athletic coping skills inventory. Remember, this, this, uh, these instruments actually measure psychological skills. And so the, on the left here, we have the treatment group. That was the, the cycling team. And on the right here, we have the individuals. This is the control group. And who we implemented the treatments on, you see a rise. It's not a significant rise, but look how many rises you see in this group. You only see one that goes down uh, versus in the control group, how many you see, you see go down. And then uh, this one goes up. So among those are coping with adversity went up, uh, concentration, confidence, achievement, motivation, goal setting, mental preparation, peaking under pressure, and freedom from worry. And with all those going up, it actually significantly rose the total score. So the total score is all those things added up. So when that goes up, there's a significance, a uh, slight significance. The coping with adversity was up significantly as well, versus your control group, who had a significant decrease in goal setting and mental preparation. And we focused a lot on goal setting and mental preparation, whereas they had no, uh, they had zero um, training in that, uh, as far as that group. And then freedom from worry, that significantly rose as well. And that could have been because of uh, various <coughs> things that they're implementing um, as far as they don't have to go to nationals. Whereas the treatment group, they have a culminating event. So when they were taking these post tests, so in this group, they were all, uh, they were very worried versus this group was not. And we can attribute the coping with adversity uh, probably to some of the mindfulness training that we did. So this is an independent sample t-test for the athlete identity measurement scale. Uh, this, what this is pointing out is that both groups are very similar in the identity for elite level athletes. The norms for an elite level athlete are 35 to 45 on this scale. So they were right in the middle, both groups, uh, not significant uh, difference in those groups. When we get to our hypothesis, hypothesis one, uh, elite cyclists experiencing a PSC program will put higher self-efficacy for psychological skills training than elite cyclists who do not participate in a uh, psychological skills training program. Both of these questions are measured on a Likert scale, uh, first off. These are validity questions. So sports psychology is a valuable part of elite training. They answer one to seven. The treatment group thought it was more, they strongly agreed with it, even though these, these results are very high. There's a little bit of a ceiling effect there, but it still came out significant in that we, we saw a significance. And then uh, in the second question, on a scale of one to 10, uh, one being low and 10 being high, how would you rate the importance of sports psychology? Uh, very similar results there. They both <laughs> felt that sports psychology was a strong part, um, mainly because of that ceiling effect and they both thought uh, the lead cyclists and they had that training. So that self, that's a self-efficacy. And then the second one, uh, below this purple battle line, we have measures in self-efficacy of psychological skills. And that's actually 28. And that uh, actually measures our thesis, or the, that first thesis, which is self-efficacy and psychological skills training program. The treatment group, the pretest was 56.32 uh, for the pretest. It significantly went up uh, after the treatment the 12 week psychological skills training program. So it went up to 59.16. And that's significant because it went up, and if you look at this, it actually went down 
their score, it, it's fairly dissimilar, but it didn't change much at all. Uh, and there's a ceiling effect in elite cyclists, so they don't have, uh, a lot of them are already exposed to this training, this type of thing. But if we can get a, an increase there in any way, that's a good thing, uh, because they've had that training, and uh, we attributed that to some of the psychological uh, psychological skills training that we implemented. A second hypothesis was that elite cyclists experience the PST program will be more successful in competition than elite cyclists who do not participate in a PST program. Uh, one thing I want to point out is team dynamics versus individual dynamics. Uh, the Linwood team, they have uh, these team dynamics. You can see these three in a row. There was a guy up the road lapping the field, and they're racing for that guy up the road. Whereas the individual, the, the individual is racing for themselves. And keep that in mind when you go to the next results page, because the treatment group did not see that significant difference that the control group did. So the results, the treat, uh, this is a paired sample two test for, dis, uh, for discipline based results. So this one's our time trial, uh, road race, and criterion. Uh, based upon the group membership. And so the treatment group, as a whole, they had negligible improvements in the road race and individual time trial. Nothing really there. Uh, and we attribute that to the team racing dynamics. Whereas the control group, they actually statistically significantly improved uh, during the criterion racing. And you can see that. So we attributed that to this, this high uh, they, they're racing for themselves, so they can actually uh, go against what the Lindenwood cyclists are doing. So it, it kind of puts the groups at, at odds there. And note that the lower score is favorable in these. This is a, the third hypothesis that we have. It's an elite cyclist experience PST program report less mood disturbance on the profile of mood state instrument and elite cyclists who do not participate in the PST program. Uh, remember, a low score for uh, all of these things is a good thing, because we don't want uh, anger, confusion, depression, <coughs> fatigue, and tension, but we do want a high score of fatigue. So I put a smiley face on each one of the control group is actually lower than. So their anger score, their confusion score, their depression, fatigue, tension, and vigor were all lower than the control group. Statistically, uh, we saw that the depression and the tension were lower. Uh, and then, with all that going into effect, we saw the treatment groups, uh, their total <coughs> score, so all those things combined, uh, when those things were implemented, the treatment group was lower, significantly lower than the control group. And one of the things, the, so from those results, we look at the PSC program. Implementing that PSC program decreased their total mood disturbance, tension, and depression. The influences that the psychological skills training program had were mindfulness, self-talk, confidence, and flow. Each of those things showing that um, with mindfulness being at the center, can actually decrease tension and depression. And down here, cited uh, a source where uh, over a short period of time, there's three one-hour mindfulness sessions to decrease the total mood disturbance, fatigue, depression, and confusion. And we actually saw a total uh, it actually decreased with, with that short term. And we were, we were able to do that every week, so implementing that probably had some significance there. The fourth hypothesis. Bear with me, I have a diagram to explain this. Uh, this is a multiple, well, I'll read the hypothesis. But it is possible to develop a successful profile to predict high level performance of elite cyclists based upon participation in a comprehensive PSC program. We used a multiple linear regression analysis to form a predictive model. Uh, we, input, we combined the treatment and the control group. In 2014 and 2015, USA Cycling results were evaluated. We, from the race results, we took the successful cyclists, we saw that they scored significantly higher on the ASCII 28 composite score. We use that as a dependent variable. Remember the ASCII 28, that measures psychological skills training. From there, uh, 
We used that, and we found that the successful cyclists scored higher than that. And we took the independent sample t test, found successful cyclists scored statistically higher on the ASCII 28 when compared to the non successful athletes. And we built this predictive model uh, using the following independent variables. So it puts them all in the sports emotional reactive profile, there's seven subscales. So the desire, service, sensitivity, attention control, competence, personal accountability, and self discipline. The composite score on the athlete, measurement scale, <coughs> training age, and chronological age. And this diagram uh, actually. Uh, if you start up at the left, which athletes are successful in 2014 15? Those are successful athletes. So we took those successful athletes and we saw that their, their score went up. And that score, that's our dependent variable. And that's the psychological skills. And we took those successful athletes. We found that they had, uh, their, this score was high. So remember, we measured all of these things we measured their training age, discipline, desire, assertiveness, sensitivity, confidence, personal confidence, and attention. And we threw them into this multiple linear regression model. And from there, we, were found, we found results. So this is a multiple linear regression model. The significance is down here. These are what's, this is what comes out. That's what spits out of this. Uh, and these, that's what traits separate successful athletes apart from their peers. So what do, what do these successful athletes have that the other ones don't who were not successful? And the independent variables were highly correlated with the dependent variables. Remember, our dependent variables ASCII 28. And these are independent variables. And the next one the results. So same hypothesis. The treatment and control group were combined. Remember that. So from here, we're looking at the independent sample t-test for ASCII 28 based upon seasonal success. So we took the <coughs> successful athletes. We found that their score was significantly higher than the negligible improvement athletes, otherwise known as non-successful athletes from 2014 to 2015. The successful athletes score on the ASCII 28 that measures psychological skills. That's your dependent variable. So from here, we can figure out, uh, by putting those independent variables through that filter that we just saw, and we can measure what's successful. So what traits separate successful elite athletes apart from their peers? Self-discipline, confidence, and attention control. All those things, we found that the regression model for predicting is successful, pro successful using a sports emotional reaction profile, all, they had all those things. The successful athletes had all of these, these traits, whereas the non-successful athletes were, uh, they had negligible improvements over 2014, 2015, they did not have as high a case in these categories. So, uh, well, sorry, they had higher traits from the ASCII 28 score. And so this, they had self-discipline, confidence, and tension control. And when you group those together, that's what created the strongest uh, p or sorry, the, the strongest correlation in that regression model. When all three of those were combined, all had strong correlations by themselves, the strongest is when all three were grouped together. So we can look through this now, and you have confidence, self-discipline, and tension control. That's what the successful athletes had. These are very important factors, but, and, but they just were not as significant. These really stood out in that model, and they really had a strong correlation uh, with being uh, a strong ASCII 28 that is a total dependent variable. So our limitations. Uh, one of them is the control groups, their exposure to psychological skills. We don't know what the psychological skills training that they had, if they had their team was implementing them or they were reading up on it because they were in the study. And another one was the treatment groups participation. Their range was 34 to 100%. That's a pretty big range, uh, with the mean being 68%. Ideally, we'd like this number to be higher at the 68%, but it wasn't. There are a lot of activities that they were doing. The small sample size in both the control group and the treatment, uh, both had small sample size. If we had a larger population of cyclists, uh, we may have seen some different results. 
in a future uh, psychological skills training program, remember we had successful athletes that had self-discipline, confidence, and tension control. And the treatment group really decreased their mood disturbance, their depression, and tension. Uh, through these things, uh, if we put mindfulness at the center, remember mindfulness is uh, having a direct awareness, uh, an open engagement, so a non-judgmental uh, um, awareness of yourself and what's going on around you. And by having that, that influences self-talk. And self-talk, what you say to yourself, is very, very, very important because it influences confidence. And confidence is something that successful athletes have. And mindfulness, as we know, is very strongly related to flow. It's optimal performance. And when you are very mindful, you can tap into these, uh, this flow state more. And mindfulness is also a self-discipline. If you're mindful, you're going to be more self-disciplined because you're practicing and you're engaging, you're very present in activity. And mindfulness also has a huge impact in your mood state. If, uh, it decreases tension and depression. And the mood disturbances decrease as well. And we know that tension control is decreased when you're relaxed and you're deep breathing and you're actually focusing on your breath. So all those things combined, uh, if we put mindfulness in it. Summary and conclusions. The participation among elite cyclists in a 12-week psychological skills in-season training program has shown to positively correlate self-efficacy towards psychological skills and emotional states. And based on this, or based on USA Cycling Race results and parameters measured in the ASCII 28, a predictive success model was created using a linear regression analysis to filter highly correlated variables using the psychometric, other psychometric instruments. And high scores in confidence, self-discipline, tension control on the sports emotional reaction profile were highly predictive of success. And like I said earlier, if we had a large population, we may have had more significance. So some references we use. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now this is where we get to hammer him. Okay? And anybody free game to ask any questions you would like to. Um, good job. I liked the, the visuals of the team. Um, I have a couple questions. The I know you have a lot going on in there, and it's kind of it's very it was hard to read, let alone complete. So I can only imagine, and I you know, I've seen all the data that you had to go through. Um, but did you think about running any? I guess some questions I had were related to the success score mm -hmm. or finding. Um, you know, the regression that you came out with. Did you do anything, I know you picked out a way to, I guess, classify who was successful and then mm -hmm. took them out and plugged them into the um, linear regression analysis. Did you think about, or did you look at anything compared to the... ...unsuccessful to see, um, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly. You know what I mean? Like, like you have like the those traits that you had. I forget what they were that popped up that said that uh, successful athletes were strong in this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Common self-discipline, tension control. Did you think about putting the unsuccessful athletes through the same regression analysis to see if they had the same thing? I know yeah, you did. We did, we did it. But that's I a great it. idea. And actually, um, we could have done a logistical regression to maybe even track what the unsuccessful cyclists were actually deficient in. Right. And that would actually be fascinating. But we didn't do that. But that would be and, and I mean, honestly, I completely understand because there's so much in there. It's like, mm -hmm. how can you weed through all that? Um, but I, the, I didn't think about it until now. So I'm like, that's all I asked you guys. Mm -hmm. um, a, another question I had, I'll let somebody else ask. <laughs> and then I'll ask another one. Uh, yeah, actually, a question. Um, I wasn't sure, if, I can't remember if you mentioned this already or not. Um, but were the were each of the individuals in the study were they all doing the same exact um, like workouts and practices and everything? Uh, that's a good question. So a lot of cyclists are on their own training plan, and a lot of them have their own coaches. So 
uh, cycling is a very individualized training. It became uh, very regimented. Uh, so no, they were not training. Um, some of them were. They, they had practices. Not all of them were. Uh, they were in those activities. I think uh, when you we saw that 68 percent. That's how many. Um, that's actually their mean score. That range that we saw was who participated in the psychological skills. And that ranged from 34 to 100 uh, percent. So a lot of the implementation that we used were videos, uh, emails, things of that nature to respond to everybody, to get them. Uh, to not take away from team meetings, not take away from time and practice. Uh, that's part of being in the in-season psychological skills training program versus an off-season where you could actually set up a set of time uh, during that time. So, uh, uh, I, did you actually measure prior to starting the study how much they were already doing in PST, or do you find cyclists actually already do some of that? And, and if so, if you did look at that, and they are at a little bit higher level because they are an individual athlete, they already have some of these skills, would that be a reason maybe why you didn't see as much of a change? Because they're already doing some of that? Or, uh, and if so, the other part is if you chose athletes that maybe weren't so elite mm -hmm. and they did the PST training prior to and after, would you not see greater differences yeah. or significant differences in their performance? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Because yeah. I think what you're doing is is very interesting, mm -hmm. and and but I think what you're doing is taking athletes that mm -hmm. maybe already do something, so you may not have seen much of a change, but to see a slight, even a mm -hmm. little bit of a difference, yeah, may shine a light on the fact that if you chose maybe not an elite group mm -hmm. and, and perform some training, yeah. you might see that a, a greater difference. Yeah. Do you think that would be the case? Or? Yeah, I, I, I do believe that. I believe that anybody can benefit from, from a lot of these things. Uh, one of the things about mindfulness is that they tell you to go back to it. Like once uh, you talk about it, you can go back to being mindful. And uh, even Buddhist monks will tell you, they practice mindfulness and they don't know. And so I think that having that uh, psychological skills of your being there at, at that level, that, and they can improve, I think it really can improve. Uh, so in a lead level, they do have a ceiling effect, um, but I think they would improve more. Yeah. Uh, my second question then is, you know, reading all of the research that you have, uh, and I know there's probably not a lot out there, but maybe you can just speculate. This is not a right or wrong answer, but just asking, uh, if, if you you only had a couple females, do you see females maybe coming out of this filter with three different types of, of the psychological skills compared to males? What what do you and, and be careful how you answer? Uh, no, I think that the right very, the very right part of a, the part of an elite group, not an elite group, is you're going to see across the board these psychological skills aren't really going to change in that group because they're performing at a high level in both groups. So um, I didn't, we didn't measure that uh, mm -hmm. just because it's a small sample, but uh, personally I don't think so. No. Chris is actually bang on the research though, though because the research actually states at a certain level of eliteness, the psychological profiles of males and females is almost identical. Is that right? Almost identical. Well, in order to be successful under that kind of pressure, I would almost anticipate it would be the same. So. Good answer. <laughs> um, can you go back to the slide? It's before this. It's, the, it's with the looking at the different, um, like the criterion and things like that, and it showed the, the control group. Don't keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, wait. No, that's not it. That's it. And, um, Okay, so I guess I have, I have a question. So the you saw regarding the, the significant improvement in the control group, mm -hmm. um, and the whole individual racing mm -hmm. aspect of that. So when looking at this, the only the only thing we see on here mm -hmm. when we're comparing differences from last year to this year or last season to this season between either group is in an individual racing event. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, do you think if there's anything to do with, 
I mean, there's not a significant improvement in anything besides in a control group who didn't receive the PST, the fish mm -hmm. club, you know. And they improved, I mean, what looks like significantly. I mean, it is significant, obviously, but like, that's yeah. dramatic. Mm -hmm. So, if we're looking for, yes, there were improvements, obviously. You can see there's decreases. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a couple increases. Where, why do you think that is? Or what does that say when it comes to team dynamics and individual dynamics? Yeah. Since you touched on that a little bit. I didn't uh, put the individual categories on, okay. on the slides, but uh, so in cycling there's individual categories. There's professional one, two, lower is better, professional is uh, And there's more in the lower categories of the control group uh, than the treatment group. So I think that had a, a slight effect on that as well. So you could say the control group might be a little bit more elite uh, than in terms of racing. Uh, that could be. Um, but there wasn't a big difference in, in that those groups, but uh, um, but there was slightly more, so maybe that slight increase uh, with the individualistic uh, the results was actually increased that, as well as the they can pick and choose. A lot of these uh, racers and uh, so at the end of them, you have to they are told when they race. So you have to race with pro race. You have to race the individual time trial. For me personally, I don't do well in the individual time trial on the road race. Uh, so, if somebody's picking a criterion race, uh, I'm going to go to a criterion race, I'm not going to go to a road race with an individual time trial who went on the way. And these, this group can, can do that. They have that, that freedom uh, where they can do that. Where versus the treatment group is, is just kind of like they have to race the mm -hmm. I guess, I guess, and that's, that's why I just was thinking, if we're trying to say, look how good this, this yeah. PST is and how yeah. effective it is, this slide doesn't show that. Do you no. know what I mean? Like, significant. But what Chris decided to do, which I thought was really clever actually, mm -hmm. after seeing this slide, mm -hmm. he actually went and said, well, obviously there's going to be successful cyclists in the treatment group and the control group based upon their change in right. score from 2014 to 2015. So he went and looked, which I, again, this is what drove the predictive model. He found that there was a very, very clear difference in the psychological skills, um, self-efficacy, for athletes who had significantly improved from 2014 to 2015 okay. when he combined groups, because that's what he ended up using as a the variable for, for what was success by combining the groups. Mm -hmm. And that shows up very clearly that there is a significant difference in self-efficacy, PST self-efficacy, or psychological skills self-efficacy based upon the successfulness of the cyclist, which I thought was a really good catch. I don't know if you highlight that enough. That was a good catch. So do you think that they should do the ASCII test for the training athletes and if they score low and don't score high cup and self-discipline or test for control, they should just not pick them for the team? No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, uh, you, you, those are definitely traits that you can train. And to, I think the ASCII and the, surf, the sports motion reactor profile, they have to be combined too. Uh, that's one of the things that we looked at with the predictive model, because those were strong influences and the ASCII score was high. So um, if we did that, psychological skills training, yeah, there'd be no drops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. And this is the part that I'm just curious about, like the actual program that you did, the actual PSC yeah. program. So did you guys just... <coughs> Say this is what I want to do. I mean, I know you know the different areas, the different, to different topics, yeah. obviously to address um, from research and everything. But how did you know? How did you come up with what to do when, mm -hmm. and you know specifically each time what to do, and how long to do it? Yeah. Uh, Jack Winsky performed the he this performance pyramid that he had, and <laughs> we actually based it on that, uh, where uh, we started with the lower categories and built our way up to the top, and so. By doing that, we were able to build upon each of the first weeks to the 12th week, uh, where the 12th week, I think, was one of the optimal performance experience. So it was, it was based upon one. Okay. Oh, I figured it was. I just didn't know, like, if you're like, you know, like, how do you, how would you know? If you really want to know, you need to take my class. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm That's here right now. These guys <laughs> Any questions from the class? Um, is the low compliance rate, is that why you generally don't do the, the PSP 
in in season in this off season since we were kind of yeah, the, uh, before? Is that the main reason why there's not really mm -hmm. there wasn't this study done before? Yeah, uh, mostly the research suggests that you do it out of season because if you do it in season, uh, a lot of the, the coaches are gonna think that you're taking time away from practice, and that's a valid point. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we did at team meetings we sent these emails out. Um, so when you take away performance during the in season, you're not you're not working on the specific because you want to specify what you're doing. Um, so that's probably the main reason. Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you worked internally, which is great, with your cycling team. How mm -hmm. would you approach it with the team you weren't familiar with? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. You have to get to know uh, the individuals. So uh, working with you know a group, you have to uh, start understanding their culture, start knowing what they're going through. Um, me being a cyclist is very easy for me to step in and start to understand these things. So I think you have to pretty much step into their world and see what they're experiencing and observe, uh, talk to the athletes and, and be more uh, present with them. Would that ever become gender specific? Do you work for directly with the women's rugby team versus the men's rugby team? Uh, I think that's an individual uh, individual reference. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Give a round of applause. That was a largest defense <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of students have ever done. So, Captive audience, right? right? <laughs> so this, this is the plan right now. What needs to happen, um, he has to stoop for a little bit, so the, the faculty will step out and talk about him behind his back. You guys will get to breathe, relax, go get a donut, and then we'll come back and start class in about 10 minutes. So let's say 7.30. Is that all right with everybody? All right, 7.30 it is.